Welcome, everyone. My name is Anne LeSage. I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Bainbridge Island. I have been here for a little over a year and a half. I came from the University of California, Irvine, where I was the Emergency Management Director there for eight years. And prior to that, worked in public health and emergency preparedness for Dallas County in Texas, LA County in Southern California, and also Washington State Department of Health during H1N1. So all of my public health background has seemed oddly fitting as we've worked through COVID-19 response and this current pandemic. And I will just say that hopefully as I go through this presentation tonight, you'll see that while Map Your Neighborhood was created really for earthquake response, it helps us prepare in a way that would be good for any type of disaster. So whether it's a pandemic, it's an earthquake, wildfire, severe winter storm, you know, one of 25 different things that could go wrong here on the island, this program really helps bring your neighborhood together in a way that everyone is able to help one another and when we do the more formal presentation and training for your neighborhoods, we really go into detail how much food, how much water. We talk a little bit about generators. We talk about utility shutoffs. So we provide you a really good basic understanding of all the things that you can do to make sure that you're ready for whatever the next disaster is. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about the program. And then we'll hear from Leslie and Pamela, two of our very active, amazing neighborhood captains. They'll share a little bit about how they have continued this process within their neighborhood and some of the advantages that they have seen from being a part of this. And then there'll be time at the end for questions. So what is Map Your Neighborhood? So on the island, this program started in about two, uh, 2008. So it's been around for around 12 years. There've been a couple fits and starts and stops. There was a contractor who worked for the city that started the process. And then the fire department took it over for a number of years and they were really active in, in going out and providing the training. And then in January of last year, this program was handed off to me at the city. And that's when we really started to build on all of the foundation that the fire department had put together. So we took a look at the map if you had a chance to click on the map that was posted on the website, you can see that around 30% of households on the island have gone through this process. And middle of last year, I did a survey to all of those neighborhoods. And I think the response rate was around 70%. And only one said they weren't currently active. So to me, that says that this program is really strong in that it keeps people engaged. People are able to go through and plan and put together all of the contact information and household inventories and all the things that you need to have to know kind of who to call and you know who lives next door and who has the kid that might be home from school by themselves because their parents live or their parents work over in Seattle. And so it's pretty exciting to see that kind of continued engagement. So 30% of the island has gone through this process. Our long-term goal is to reach every single household. And really this program is the foundation of everything that we do to prepare our community. And I don't have time tonight and I wasn't really planning on talking about the bigger picture of preparedness. We have a partnership between the fire department, the city and Bainbridge Prepares, our community nonprofit. But what I'll do is after this, I'll follow up with an email that shares just some different links. We have a number of different training programs and teams that you can participate in beyond Map Your Neighborhood. But really this is the foundation. If our individual households aren't prepared and our neighbors aren't prepared, when something big happens, I'm never gonna have enough resources to help all 25,000 people who live here on top of the people who just got off the ferry and are now stuck in downtown Winslow or the people commuting on 305 who are stuck because the bridge is, isn't passable or the sports teams that we're visiting here at the high school. So we really wanna make sure that 
we have a plan for the most critically injured and the folks who are just stuck here because they work here, they don't live here, they were visiting, and that the rest of us are able to help each other. So that's the foundation of Map Your Neighborhood. So specifically, the way that the program works is we teach you what you need to do immediately following a disaster. So some of the steps are focused on earthquake. So that's where we talk about how to shut off your propane tank, where to look for your water line and other utility shutoffs. So some of it is very earthquake specific, but in general, the other parts of the program that fit in is you complete what's called the household inventory. And so you actually will fill it out for your household to say, you know, I am a doctor, I have medical training and I could help if someone is injured or so-and-so has CPR first aid training, or they are an expert at using a chainsaw. There are different tools and skills that we take inventory of, and then we piece that all together into your neighborhood plan. So you'll actually know, all right, the tree fell down and is blocking the main exit and entrance to our neighborhood, but we know that Bill next door has the chainsaw and feels confident to go and cut the tree and get it out of the way. The other thing is creating that neighborhood contact list. So you actually have names and phone numbers and emails and you'll have the information on who has pets, who has young children, who has specific um, you know, disabilities or access and functional needs and might need some additional assistance. The other thing I wanna say is that if you choose to serve as your neighborhood captain or you have a co-captain you're working with, that information lives with you. It doesn't get turned into me at the city. It didn't get turned into the fire department. So the, some of the questions we get are around privacy and the concern about that information. So it's living with you or whoever ends up being the neighborhood captain and it's not turned into any other entity. So that's not something that we retain. It's not something that I need to have. All I keep track of is the name of the neighborhood, the number of households, and then the name of the contact of our, our captain. And so then the other thing that we go through is we teach you what do you do now that there has been an earthquake or now that you've lost power and we talk through those specific steps about how do you go to your neighborhood gathering point and actually do that initial assessment and you're able to check off the list. Well, you have 12 households and only 10 showed up. So who are the two that didn't show up? And then you can assign people to go and check on those two houses. So the process is to help understand, is everyone okay? And if not, how can we get help and resources to those households that maybe, maybe they were on vacation and that's great, or maybe there's someone stuck inside or they just happen to be at, way, at work. But that way you're able to take that initial information and then help respond. So the nuts and bolts of how this actually happens. So after tonight, if you decide, all right, we're, we're in, we want to do this with our neighborhood. And if you're one of those individuals that needs me to help define your neighborhood, we'll do that first. And then basically you just pick a date and time. So pre COVID, we would actually come out. So myself or one of our trainers would come to your neighborhood. Someone would host the training and we would be able to have a nice happy hour where everyone just comes and hangs out. Right now we're doing everything through Zoom. So if you find one or two dates and times that work for 90% of your neighborhood, then we can narrow in We'll confirm with our trainers and it will either be me or one of our other trainers that actually, you know, uh, does this training over Zoom. And then all we need back is the street numbers and the number of households that are included because we actually create a map for you so we can print it. We can print it two feet by three feet or we can just email it to you. And that's something you can actually mark up with people's names mark the propane tank locations, and you can mark it up and have this be a really working map of your neighborhood. So once we pick a date and time, send out the calendar invite, then we have a time for everyone to meet. Right now, we have 
a very flexible schedule, as you can imagine. Um, everyone's working remotely and a lot of our volunteer trainers are retired. So we can pretty much make any date and time work. Most neighborhoods either pick a weekday around six o'clock, 6.30, or a weekend around two or three in the afternoon. But if there's a particular reason why you want a different date and time, there's, you know, just let me know and we can make it work. So once we pick that time, I'll email you. There are three handouts that we normally print, but now we'll just email to you and then you can pass along to your neighborhood. And then there is one thing that is not available in a digital form and that's the Map Your Neighborhood booklet. So what I've been doing is actually dropping it off to the neighborhood captain and then they either email the neighborhood and say, I'm leaving this on my porch, come and pick up the booklet. Um, Vineyard Lane, we left it by their mailboxes. So it just depends on what makes sense, but that's the only thing you actually have to have in hand. Everything else is available electronically. And then the training takes anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. Smaller neighborhoods, we can get done in an hour. Um, larger neighborhoods, or if people have a lot of questions, it can take 90 minutes, but that's pretty much it. So at that kickoff, we talk about disasters that are specific to Bainbridge Island and the Pacific Northwest. We talk specifically about how much food, how much water, other types of emergency supplies. We talk about how to create a family communication plan, reunification points. We talk about just the different things that we want you to think through when it comes to preparedness. And so it's a pretty in-depth hour of content and then there's time for questions. So we want to get to any details that you have specific to your neighborhood you know, we can look at maps ahead of time and say, okay, you are in a landslide zone or you are prone to liquefaction. You know, we have a lot of the hazard mapping for the island. And so we're able to provide some specific detail about your neighborhood uh, when we do the training. So after that, then what happens? So if you have become the host and you've become the captain, that's great. If there's someone else that's gonna be assigned that role, that's fine. Basically, we need you to pick your neighborhood captain. And then from there, you have kind of this checklist of stuff to do. So pick a neighborhood gathering point. For some neighborhoods, if they're a part of an HOA and there's a clubhouse, that's great. Other neighborhoods, it might be the house that's in the middle if it's a cul-de-sac, maybe it's the end of the cul-de-sac. Just depends. It's not something that we tell you what to do. You just pick what makes sense, and then that becomes a part of your plan. The gathering point is where everyone meets to do that check-in that we talked about. And then everyone completes the household data collection sheet. So that's that skills inventory and tools inventory. So you'll know someone has a boat, someone has a paddleboard or a kayak, some other tool or you know watercraft that will be useful, and then all of those skills. So that's something that everyone fills out, turns in to the neighborhood captain, and then really the only part that is a little bit tedious is compiling that. So we give you a word template where you input all of that information, you type up everyone's contact information, and then that becomes your plan that then you can email out to your whole neighborhood. And I will tell you that some of our captains have gone above and beyond where they've made laminated binders for wow. every household. Um, I mean, there's some very dedicated, creative people uh, in this community. You don't have to do that. You want to, that's great. But really it's just having that basic plan compiled together so everyone has the information. So you can go as far as you want with it, but the main thing is just having that, that plan put together. And then what happens is if you are the captain, you become a part of our captain's network. We have quarterly meetings. The last two have been on Zoom and everyone just talks about, you know, what's working, what's not. We've been able to debrief during COVID talked about how are neighborhood, neighbors helping neighbors, especially at the beginning where individuals needed people to go grocery shopping or take them to a doctor's appointment or, you know, especially if you are medically fragile, 
there are resources in this community that we want to make sure we're getting people connected with. And a lot of that happens through Map Your Neighborhood. So these are just some ideas. There's some fun things that our captains have done over the years. Um, typically, when we can meet in person, um, everyone's motivated by food and drink. And so to have <laughs> potlucks or just, you know, cul-de-sac parties, um, people really like to do that where you can get together in person. You can do neighborhood walkthroughs and actually go and look at everyone's propane tank and everyone's water shut off and where do you keep your emergency supplies. Some neighborhoods have done joint emergency supply kits. I know um, co-housing right around the corner from where I live, Winslow co-housing, they have a storage shed where they have some of their community supplies. Other neighborhoods have done an apocalypse potluck where you have to make food using stuff that's canned and in your emergency kit or <laughs> using the freeze dried food. So there's some really fun things that you can do um, to get everyone together. Um, a couple other things, people have actually done an exercise where you send a text to everyone in your neighborhood and you can either let them know ahead of time or not and say, all right, let's pretend that right now the earthquake is hit. We're all gonna meet at the gathering point in 10 minutes and see who shows up. And then based on the number of households that are there, you can give assignments to say, okay, two doors down, no one came, four doors down, no one came. And you go around and you do that assessment. The last page of the Map Your Neighborhood booklet is a sign that says, okay, on one side and help on the other. And so if you're okay, you tape that on your front door or the front window. And if you need help or someone in your house needs help, you put the help sign out. So there's just a lot of different ways that you can continue to engage. I would say most neighborhoods get together at, at least once a year. Um, other neighborhoods, the captains might send a note out once a month or once a quarter. You know, it's really up to you. It, it also does depend on the size of your neighborhood, but this isn't supposed to be complicated. It's supposed to be something that's fun, gets everyone together, and I think it just makes you feel good knowing that you have a plan in place if something happens. You know that you're taking care of one another. And for me, uh, so I came from California. I always joke that this would never work in California because one, you don't know your neighbor and two, you don't really want to know your neighbor. But here, the day I moved into my condo, I had a handout of here's everyone's name and email and phone number. If you need anything, let us know. I'm like, where did I move into? This is so weird. Like in California, you just, that doesn't happen. So that's one thing that's even more special about Bainbridge Island is that sense of community and the sense of belonging. And so I think this program really just feeds right into what makes this community very special. So that's the formal slides. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to Leslie and then to Pamela to talk a little bit about their neighborhood and how they have loved their experience of being a captain. So go hey, ahead. Thanks, Leslie. Anne. Yeah. Okay. It's been, it's really been a joy and um, I'm in the Commodore Lane neighborhood with some feelers off to the folks on Capstan Drive, but um, basically organized Commodore Lane, which has 65 homes. And it all started in about 2008 or 2009 when I heard a presentation by the contractor for the city talk about this Map Your Neighborhood program. And coming from Iowa, my husband and I had retired from the university there um, a, a year or so before we thought, well, this is a good idea. So I decided to go around and meet everybody in the neighborhood, not knowing what I was getting into really. So I started out with just the end of Commodore, like we live at the end of Commodore Lane pretty much, not quite to the end cul-de-sac, but along the uh, bent over straight part. Um, so I got the 15 people in that area. And then I thought, well, well, gosh, it kind of continues on into that cul-de-sac and then into that one. And 
by the time I was finished, and it did take about two years, um, I had everybody, maybe just a year and a half, um, everybody's information, basic information enough to put a directory together that the city then put into a long Excel spreadsheet that was ridiculous, but we figured out how to get it compressed <laughs> into a, a Word document and such. So in doing that, I had met everyone in the neighborhood. For most people, I'd been in their homes and just had a chance to chat one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that's one of the most important things to do, even though we're in this age of Zoom. And that is when you start out and you're planning to actually make this happen, have the information for a general invitation or an about map your neighborhood um, that you can with a rock set on a person's porch, ring their doorbell and wait until they answer and introduce yourself from about six or eight feet back, mask on and so on. So they have a chance to see you, you have a chance to see them and that in-person interaction I think really sells it a whole lot. Um, and if people are informed it's a Zoom meeting, hey, that's, that's fine, they've met you, they're more likely to come and I think that's really good. And I wound up finding out that I am a patient person, a persistent person, and one who goes at things with positivity because some of those homes I had to go back to to find someone home, uh, maybe five times. So it was back and just keep at it, keep at it. And when you think 65 homes, that is a lot. Um, but it was such a joy because I, uh, it's really important to me to be participating in building a community, um, participating in that. I, I was a newbie and a lot of people had known each other for maybe 30 years. It's a really diverse neighborhood, um, age-wise, ethnicity, internationality, just all sorts of stuff, income-wise, just it's, it's a wonderful place. Um, and from my background in nursing, I was very into facilitating communication. So of course, that uh, contact list that, that you were handed, and when you first arrived, that was something I wanted to get done right away, so as fast as I could. So getting everybody's email and their um, phone number so that you can provide everyone with that kind of a service. And then um, getting information, being, having been a teacher, getting information for myself and then sharing it and secondarily getting all the stuff you need to be prepared but all of it's about being prepared building community and so on and i think it's it's really happened i'm i'm one who likes to send out well it used to be every month but um, i've slipped up some uh a message about emergency preparedness once a month and i keep it changed with whoever is new in the neighborhood people leave and so on i keep try to keep up through individual cul-de-sac leaders i call them the block captains who will send me the information if i remind them to um, and so people feel really comfortable asking each other someone from way down at the south end of the whole commodore lane uh, recently came up to another neighbor who's up uh, right near us at the north end and the person at the north end was just commenting to me you know they think that we are just um, the aero rental the uh, for whatever kind of equipment or whatever is needed because we have it and we like to share it and they, she was chuckling about that that it was kind of a, a fun way to be um, when we had the um, snow collapse um, when anyone heard noises outside like cars not being able to move people who happened to be at home were out there figuring out ways we can dig this guy out or whatever. And that was really helpful. And they know everybody's, everybody knows everybody's email address because I don't do Yahoo groups. I just, it's the whole, I have about 99 different people on this distribution list and it's there so you can find them um, each time. And people tend to, to actually use that. So at one time, um, we have a very muddy path that kids need to go across to get over the shortcut to the high school. And one of the moms put something out on our distribution list and pretty soon we had a person saying, I'm going to bring some gravel. I'll bring some gravel. Oh, we'd better get permission for this. And pretty soon we had this whole group into building a path. So that's 
not a disaster or a super emergency, but for those kids slogging through the mud, it was pretty important. And then when COVID hit, sending the list out, people could put out, hey, I'm happy to go shopping for whoever. Here's my phone number, my address, and so on. So I'm happy to help you. And uh, something on the more fun side, we've had sing-alongs, sound of music, whatever. People standing in their driveways doing a thing that you saw at the beginning in Italy. Um, but one day when I was doing my usual walk through the neighborhood, just sort of thinking, my neighborhood, I love all these people. Um, because it's such a good feeling when you do this and you do know most everybody. Um, there was a cellist sitting in the middle of a cul-de-sac and everybody was for that cul-de-sac had their chairs out there six feet apart, masked, and a beautiful cello concert mm -hmm. was happening because one of the neighbors is a musician. So very important. It's not just the doctors and nurses that are great to know about, but people are just making those kind of offerings to others. And it's just, it's a great sense of neighborhood we have here. So that's Commodore Lane. That's with, great. Uh, feelers Thank into Capstan. Thank you. All right. And now I'll turn it over to Pamela. Her neighborhood is awesome because when I went and did a training, I got barbecued ribs. And so I just always <laughs> remember the <laughs> fantastic back when we could meet in person. That was very well. <laughs> that was a sweet day, yes. Good evening, everyone. I'm your instructor, so I feel like we should all just like take a deep breath in. <laughs> and out. I'll keep this really quick because um, I will just share some highlights. I decided to um, do Map Your Neighborhood because I was new to the island and I was really freaked out about living on a fault line and I wanted to feel like I was doing something to help um, myself and I wanted to know my neighbors. So another friend of mine, we just made up our own little signs and we, like Marsha said, went door to door and like knocked and handed them out. Um, we didn't know about like the size range we were aiming for. So we did like up and down Baker Hill, um, like 50 homes. And then we had um, one big, huge party where um, everybody gathered. And then we broke everything up into like pods. I don't know if you can see this, but this was like our map. And each, um, then we made like a purple pod and a yellow pod and a red pod. And um, people were, um, intended to like choose their captains. I didn't actually keep track of everybody else, but my little purple pod of 10 um, decided to gather twice a year. And it was like an optional potluck, bring something if you, you know, food or drink if you want to. We uh, rotated home so that we could meet, meet each other's pets and learn where those shutoffs were. And um, in between meetings, we just have a, a little email list going so we can, we can stay in touch. And the benefits have been, um, you know, if you guys choose to do this, like you get more prepared, you learn a lot and you get the joy of like knowing that the people around you are also more prepared because that's gonna have, you know, we're, to a degree like only as prepared as our neighbors are right because we're all like interconnected and so that's been great some there's been a sense of community that's developed some of us have gone on to do trainings together like a cpr one of our um, members has gone on to get ham radio trained which is fantastic and um i've become friends with one of the um 70 something year old neighbors. I, I cat sit for her. I house it for her. She had me over for tea yesterday. So she lives alone. I live alone. And it's just like this very sweet connection that, you know, probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, uh, let's see. And there's just a lot of gratitude. Um, people are always like, I feel like it's really simple. I mean, I like send out some, you know, an email with like, hey, what dates work for you for our meetings? And people are like, thank you so much for doing this. And I'm like, it's really not that hard, but you're so welcome. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so we're going to transition. Our, our last meeting was canceled because it was supposed to be like, like early March, right as everything was like blowing up and we weren't officially at stay at home orders, but we decided to, you know, be cautious and not meet. And so we kind of skipped that meeting and did some email and now we're gonna do a Zoom meeting um, in the fall. We meet in the spring and the fall time. So, um, and I guess my one tip would be is that form of like skills and address and kids' names would be to try to get that everyone to fill that out during your time together because 
tracking it down is not fun. And I'm guessing if, if we're transitioning to Zoom meetings for these, even having like a digital Google Doc where people could just log on and do it right then and there would be the easiest uh -huh. way. And they can always update it. If um, <laughs> it was so funny, one woman was like, I thought I had a chainsaw, but it turns out it's a leaf blower. <laughs> <laughs> Very different. <laughs> Um, so, and the other small tip would be like for kids is to put next to their name in parentheses, the year that they were born, because if you just say like, oh, they're 15 and then, you know, update it for like four years, you know, the kid's going to be off to college. So you actually maybe don't even need to be like looking for them necessarily if you, you're over there. So that would be my date. Just put their, the year that they're born. Um, but it's fun and I like it and you get to hang out with Anne. You, Anne's so awesome. So, um. That's my, that's my story. All right. Thank you, Pamela.